Hello learners, welcome to this course on creative writing. We are today going to talk about the art of creating poetry. We need to understand what poetry is all about. As we all know, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions and these emotions when recollected in tranquility gives rise to poetry. So primarily what we understand is how do we create poetry? A warm welcome. I am Anamika Shukla from the School of Humanities at Indira Gandhi National Open University. Today we will focus our attention on the various themes that we address while writing poetry. Now we are also going to talk about personae. Let me tell you when I utter the word personae, what do we understand by that very word? While attending the performance of a play, we have often come across this word dramatis personae. So in the program cards or in the theater, etc., etc. Now this expression means characters in the play. That is, those persons who are involved in the happenings in the drama, in the scenes of the play. So similarly in poetry, personae, which means the plural of persona, are the figures and voices which constitute the theme in certain poems. Our aim in this module is to make you understand what this personae is when we are writing poetry and through whose voice a poem is articulated. So what we are going to learn here or I should say the outcome at the end of this module is going to be you are going to learn a poem communicates its meanings through the speaking voice of personae. You are also going to understand that the persona can be the poet himself or a character or a historical or a fictional character which the poet creates. Now this persona can also develop into a symbol. The poet sometimes creates a persona with the help of his language and verse. Sometimes he creates so with the use of rhythm. So the creation of persona or personae helps a poet depersonalize his experience. So how does a poet depersonalize his experience through the use of a character through the creation of a persona. Now we will be able to identify the various voices in a poem. We are also trying to make you understand how do you find your own true voice. So you know what happens is when we begin you may find that there are different or multi voices of the poets uh, you know and then then you've liked most of them have been blended in your own voice because you're trying to produce a tone which is distinctively yours which is very very unique to yourself so you know what happens is as you practice writing the other voices recede as you keep on writing as you proceed in the process so now what happens is primarily we focus our attention on the themes in poetry now there are different kind of themes in poetry which we must know uh, and before understanding the themes we also need to understand something about the persona in a poem now every poem has a speaking voice there may be two or more speaking voices this implies that there should be one or more persons in every poem to whom the voice or voices would belong. Now the speaking voice can be of the poet himself. For example, when the poet says, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense. 
Now it can be of a character which is real or imaginary that the poet you know creates or maybe the poet needs. For example, when he says, I met a traveler from an antique land. So the poet can also create two as Wordsworth does. We are seven in the leech gatherers. Or there could be, you know, several as in Eliot's wasteland. So there could be several voices with the relevant personae. So we are going to talk about these personae. Most important is how they are put across and become articulate through figures, through images and symbols and also through the use of language and rhythm. We are also trying to understand what their function is in the writing of a poem. Now, what happens is the, these personae can be rendered, you know, they can be rendered through voices and figures. They can also be expressed through images and symbols. We can also use language and rhythm to create these persona and also through structure of the poem. So now I'm going to deal with all these one by one. How do you create personae through voices and figures? This is what we are trying to understand. Now, you know, what happens is when we say unvoiced poem, so there is no such thing as an unvoiced poem. Not only does the progression of the central idea, but also the very substance of a poem reside in the voice that makes up the poem. So all poems begin with, you know, uh, probably they have their being in and they, they close with voices. So the voice can be uh, that of the poet himself who is trying to speak directly to the reader or the listener. It may even assume the voice of the reader or it can be the abstract voice of the universe, of the God. You know, for example, in the Dohas of Kabir, you have the poet referring to himself in the third person. So, as you may also have a plurality of voices, we shall, you know, soon try and understand these usages as we proceed in this module. But, you know, let us recall that each voice issues from a figure. So, the figure behind the voice is, you know, the persona through whom the poet chooses to express himself. Let me repeat, the figure behind the voice is the persona through whom the poet chooses to express himself. The, now this figure may be historical or it could be, you know, purely fictional. But in either case, the context and content, they harmonize with the necessary dramatic lyricism to make the poem and to give the poem its entity. So, you know, I would like to share a poem uh, by Srikant Verma, which is entitled Hastinapur. Uh, let me read out the few lines. Spare a thought to the man who comes to Hastinapur and exclaims, no, no, it can't be Hastinapur. Spare a thought to the man who is suddenly all alone. Does it make any difference when the battle of Mahabharat was fought? If possible, spare a thought also to the city of Hastinapur, for which at short intervals several battles of Mahabharat are being fought, and yet it makes no difference to anyone except to the man who arrives in Hastinapur and exclaims, no, no, this can't be Hastinapur. So now in this poem, there are two voices at play here. The omniscient voice through which we are given the poem and there is, a, you know, a very small second voice of the dramatic figure brought to life 
by using the single exclamation no no it can't be Hastinapur. So you know you can hardly have this poem or probably the likes of this poem without this secondary figure. It is around him that the original voice weaves its magic and for him the poem does not exist. So you know we, we, we kind of understand how equally indispensable are the two voices in this poem and the single character is equally important who makes up this poem. So when we use the terms like first or second it is not to confer any value on them but you know we are trying to establish a distinction between them in order to you know understand their occurrence in the poem. Let me also try to you know let us again examine another small example a very simple poem uh, a very closely you know, and then try to understand how the two voices have you know given a voice or probably I should say a tongue to a work of art. Now this poem naturally divides itself into three parts and we are asked to consider three things. You know let us try and understand how. See what happens is the first thing we understand is the appearance of a stranger in a certain geographical setting. Second important uh, part of the poem is his sudden isolation that brings in mythic historicity of that setting and finally the third part the place Hastinapur which is known uh, both in geography and history. So it is you know probably rendered as an as a relevant uh, necessity or the or to the politics and social realities of the day. Now the, in, the, the whole poem closes with the stranger's words of unbelief and frustration at the place where he finds himself and what he sees is what he feels and this lone figure stands surrounded by a sea of indifference. So what, what we are trying to you know understand by uh, examining this poem is that the poem naturally divides itself into three parts. So we, we, ki we kind of try and understand the three uh, stages of the poem. It also has two voices who are being you know rendered by a single character but these two voices we can name them as first and second voice are important and they interweave with each other to create the persona of the poem. I would also like to you know read another poem by Nizim Ezekiel and let us try and examine this poem when he says Pushpa, Miss Pushpa is never saying no. Whatever I say or anybody is asking she is always saying yes and today she is going to improve her prospects and we are wishing her bone voyage. Now I ask another speaker to speak and afterwards Miss Pushpa will do the summing up. So what I am trying to make you understand is would Eliot have written these lines if the tiger in Blake's had not left its burning impress on his mind. So the poetic metamorphosis of the Christ figure into a tiger or a sphinx come to life are two outstanding examples of the symbolic use of images from 20th century English poetry. So what we happens is you know if I read out the lines from Eliot's Gerontion in the Jovensense of the ear came Christ the tiger and later in the same poem he says the tiger springs in the new year us he devours. So you know the question is how would Eliot write these lines if Eats had not earlier written in his the second coming. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep 
we are vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle and what rough beast its are come round at last slouches towards to be born so what i'm trying to understand and make you understand is that the poetic metamorphosis of tiger or probably two different objects create you know you you kind of become or you use the symbols to to kind of create images and that is how you create a persona now this persona can also be created through language and rhythm let me you know give you an example of a short excerpt from eliot's wasteland uh, he says you know but at my back soda water before continuing so what happens is the first line of the poem is an echo of marvels to his coy mistress when he says but at my back i always hear so to begin with you could read this masterpiece of a poem with pleasure and profit and also because you can then follow the change in the language and rhythm introduced by eliot in his use of the lines following his quotations from marvel now this deliberate anti climax and irony is introduced by wrenching the language round you know suddenly to a contemporary idiom whose popular rhythm is in direct contrast to the first line so we see that the original lines from john day's uh, parliament of bees when he says a noise of horns and hunting which shall bring so 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 now these lines have changed to the sound of horns in water which shall bring sweeney to mrs porter in the spring so the change in language and rhythm you know it has completely transformed the persona and it has also created an anti climatic reduction so this is how you know we create a persona now let me talk about persona and structure the mode of speaking through fictional through historical or through dramatic persona is an important way of depersonalizing your own experience a way of distancing yourself away from the emotion while at the same time intensifying it for the reader so you know you're doing two things simultaneously you are kind of depersonalizing yourself you know you're depersonalizing your experiences and you are also you know intensifying your emotions for the reader so this becomes possible when you realize that you are not required to speak in your personal capacity it is your character who speaks as the situation or the context demands so a poem which reads like a completely personal statement uh, you know it could be an entirely successful poem but when a poet's account of what sees a personal statement uh has been depersonalized to the point where it is universally applicable the poem becomes more interesting and more exciting every poem has a speaking voice or voices through which the poet communicates with the reader the poem you know behind the voice are the personae which are which are created by the poet the persona can be the poet himself or a historical or a fictional character which he employs persona can be you know given a symbolic value or delineated with the help of certain chosen language and rhythms now this persona can help a poet to depersonalize experiences so you know this is an important a uh, feature when we are trying to understand writing poetry in this course of creative writing now what is important is read as much poetry as you can and you will automatically observe that in each poem there is a voice or voices and 
a corresponding speaker or speakers. So, you know, you, you will probably try and understand uh, those experiences, try and understand and, and try imagining those experiences and how do you kind of depersonalize those experiences and then probably universalize them, you know, for example, death. So, this is how you know you are going and, and probably make a list of these experiences for your future reference. So, this is how you know you, you have to think about certain things while you are building up an image of the speaker. You know you are trying to you have to probably think about that are you making are you making your speech formal or informal? You know are you are you kind of uh, coming up what kind of feeling are you coming up? and and what kind of attitude are you going to inculcate in the voice of the speaker and also the status of the speaker because you know uh, there are times where you kind of distance yourself as a writer as a poet from the immediate experiences and then also you can talk about those experiences as universal phenomena for example you know uh, probably you can talk about death, you can talk about funerals as general universal phenomenon and you can also you know distance yourself from the immediate experience of death of a loved one. You know this is how you are going to create distances. Now there are certain things that you also need to understand is when, when I say what images, now what are images? So primarily, uh, you know, before winding up this module, I would like to make you understand uh, what, do, what do I mean when I say images, because images are physical representations of people, of animals, of objects, which are created in poetry through words and phrases and of course, figurative language. Now, the persona or figure or speaker that appears in a poem, uh, you know it could be a poet himself or may not be a poet himself is the persona and the rhythm is the movement which is created in a poem through the use of uh, you know those measured syllables or words and the entire framework of a poem we kind of addresses as structure you know that is the, the the physical construction or the way it is built up through the use of stanzas and couplets and rhymes etc. So primarily what we have tried and understood in this module is that how do we create personae through the use of uh, various uh, you know uh, uh, like figures and voices and and different kind of uh, creatures. So, you know we, we kind of produce different kind of tones which could be distinctly distinctively of the writer, the poet here you know and what happens is as you kind of you know probably embark on this journey the other the other voice recedes as you keep writing. So, you know try and vouch different kind of themes in poetry and how do you create different kinds of personae while writing a poem. Thank you.